Trucker Dump for October 28th, 2011, episode 77, Arguing E-Logs. Welcome to Trucker Dump, where you'll get one driver's insights and sometimes humorous views of truck driving and the trucking industry, and pretty much anything else he feels like dumping on you. This podcast is brought to you by AboutTruckDriving.com. Resources to help you understand the world of truck driving through the use of stories and a pathetic attempt at humor. Wait, don't run. Yes, I know it's another post on e-logs, but the good news is it's probably my last. Okay, okay, put down the pom-poms. You people are mean. (laughs) Todd McCann here. You know, since I know you're eager to get this started and therefore over with, here's why it's hard arguing e-logs. Unless something unprecedented happens in the near future, like my company changes a policy for the better, this should be the last in a long series about e-logs. Now I know that you're probably already in the midst of doing a happy little jig about this wonderful news, but let me explain why this should be the last. I can do so in one sentence. Nearly every argument I make against e-logs is comparing it to the illegal ways I can manipulate paper logbooks. I've had questions about electronic logs before I even got them. Check out Fear and Loathing of Electronic Logs for my initial thoughts. There's a link in the show notes to that podcast and the blog post. Turns out most of my fears were warranted. For example, let's take a brief look at my first run that I took while sneering at my shiny new e-log unit. Basically, I was pissed because I figured my time wrong, a rookie mistake, and therefore delivered my load late. Details are in the podcast, E-Logs, My First Impression. There'll be a link to that in the show notes, too. If I'd have still been on paper logs, I undoubtedly would have taken off a bit earlier because I knew I could fudge the logbook a little bit. But the unrelenting clock on the E-Log system doesn't allow that. Now, would I be hurting anyone if I left an hour or two early so I could avoid being in a rush and possibly have a chance at delivering early? I don't think so. I'd had plenty of sleep. I'd been off duty way longer than my mandatory 10-hour break required. This all makes sense to a truck driver, but try arguing this point to the authorities and you're talking to the wind. That's because leaving early and marking your logbook after you get somewhere is illegal. Here's another example. One of the things that most makes me want to hand my e-log unit to my youngest nephew, that kid can destroy anything with the slightest touch, happens when I'm trying to find a parking spot late at night. You can find a perfect scenario of this in the podcast called E-Logs, Do They Really Increase Driving Time? Link in the show notes. With e-logs, you have to start looking for a parking spot earlier than most drivers would like because you have to be parked when the e-log clicks down to zero. That means I have to start looking for a place to park at about the 10 hour mark. But on paper logs, I can utilize more of my drive time by pulling into a truck stop when my 11 hours of driving is up. If I can't find a spot there, I just show stopping there for the night and drive on to the next available parking. If it took me another 30 minutes to find parking, I just leave 30 minutes later the next day. Again, this is illegal according to the folks who supposedly know what's best for us truck drivers. What about how e-logs keep on counting down your time when you're in rush hour traffic? I really hate that because when I was on paper logs, I could just show that I stopped at a truck stop to wait out rush hour. I mean, what's the difference? Either I'm creeping along in rush hour or I'm sitting in a truck stop for an hour. But again, logging yourself at a truck stop while you're sitting in traffic is illegal. So there's my point. I'm trying to convince everyone that e-logs suck because I can't run illegal like I used to regardless of the fact that these illegal acts don't really hurt anyone. That's really what it boils down to, and ultimately why all arguments against e-logs will fail worse than a 98-pound sumo wrestler. Now here's another side of the coin. Sometimes I've wanted to prove a point about e-logs, but I can't because doing so would backfire like Elmer Fudd's shotgun when Bug sticks his finger in the barrel. Usually it winds up being a case of logging it as you do it. First up is how we drivers log at customers, the shippers or receivers. Every company I've worked for has crammed the phrase, log it as you do it, down my throat. Yet without fail, these same companies have told me to log 15 minutes of on-duty time, that's mandatory at most carriers, as soon as I get there or just before I leave. Why then? Because not doing so could totally screw up a 10-hour break and make me as inefficient as scraping your windshield with a nickel. Let me explain that. 
Say I pull into a receiver at 2 a.m. and I log myself in the sleeper berth. My appointment is at 8 a.m. So if I'm logging it as I do it, I should put myself on the on-duty line for 15 minutes at 8 a.m. while I check into the office and back into the dock. Then I put myself back in the bunk. But that would interrupt the continuous 10-hour break that the law requires. That means I'd have to start my break over again. So by logging it as I'm doing it, I'd have to be shut down for 16 hours instead of 10. That's 6 hours before I checked in and 10 hours after. The company doesn't want this and neither does any trucker. So in this case, I don't want to go in and call the company's scruples into question by saying, Hey, Mr. By the Book, how come I have to log it as driving while sitting in a traffic jam, but I don't have to log it as on duty when I bump a dock in the middle of my 10-hour break? Talk about shooting myself in the foot with an elephant gun. What if they thought about it real hard and decided I was right? Which policy do you think they'd change? Yeah, that's what I thought, too. Or how about the fact that the company only requires me to log 15 minutes to do my pre-trip inspection? What if it takes 30 minutes or 45? Well, I don't want to waste my valuable on-duty time, so I'm not going to log it as I do it in this case either. The company may say that they want you to log it correctly, but they don't really want you eating up your hours either. Fine by me. There is, however, one thing I won't give up on. There is absolutely no reasonable excuse for not making e-logs editable by the driver. Most carriers realize this and have given their drivers a big old pink electronic eraser. <laughs> not mine. They set them up according to the DOT suggested guidelines. I have no words for how stupid this is. On paper logs, we can make changes and initial them if we screwed up. With my company e-logs, changes can only be made by a member of the safety department. If no one is there to make the changes until the next morning, I'm still required to electronically sign my log as accurate at the end of the day. Since the only button available is to OK it, if I choose not to sign, I choose not to move. Even if I'm fully aware I'm signing a log that I know the safety department will change in the morning. And yes, I brought this fact up to the safety director. All I can say is he'd make a good politician. I still don't have a satisfactory answer. Am I nitpicking? Yes, I am. But a driver's logbook is a legal document that can and will be used to protect or defend us in a court of law. What happens if I have an accident causing a fatality before the safety department changes my log? Yes, the chances are slim, but it is a possibility. The fact is, I shouldn't even be put in this position. Yet I am. Okay, now that my blood pressure is testing the integrity of my veins, I'll just suck it up and accept the fact that my company are boneheads when it comes to e-logs. If it weren't for the money. Now let's close this sucker up. You can now see why I'm bringing my unhealthy obsession with e-logs to a close. I just can't win. Most truckers would agree with everything I said, but throw the argument against e-logs at the lawmakers and I'd end up looking dumber than, well, dumber than I actually am. And quite frankly, that's pretty freaking hard to do. Hey, yo, bud, where do you want this load of feedback? Well, 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 look at you people go. I asked for comments on the spitting Christian zealot, and I got them. So let's get cracking. Patty, that's Love18Wheels on Twitter says, I pretty much feel just about the way you do on all the issues you discussed. It's too bad there are so many so-called Christians that are giving being a Christian a bad name. That spitting zealot ought to look up the meaning of being a real Christian and show a little tolerance and control. It's sending the wrong message. I guess he doesn't even realize that? Well, hidey ho Miss Patty. The only thing I can think is that all Christians seem to pick and choose parts of the Bible that they like. I try not to do that, but I know I'm guilty of that myself. But it appears he's leaving out most scriptures. It's sad, really, and frustrating for the rest of us. Thanks for stopping by again, Patty. Becca writes, Well said. I also agree with a lot of your points. I had religion basically shoved down my throat when I was growing up and rebelled against it. However, I still consider myself a Christian today and know that God is there. I'm glad I was raised with those morals rather than without them. Well, hey, welcome back, Becca. I'm sure that's why most of us rebelled. I know I did. It was great to have that background to establish good morals, but when it comes to drawing closer to God, I think we have to get there on our own. We have to figure out whether we believe in Him or not. 
I think all the evidence points towards believing. Glad you do, too. And folks, this next one from Jen is the way you should write from an opposing point of view. She says, I wanted to thank you for your post. It's well-reasoned, and even though I don't share your beliefs on many issues, I absolutely respect your position and your way of living your faith. Bravo. Well, thanks, Jen. All I ask is that people read the article and learn that the Bible teaches us Christians how we're supposed to act to others. The world would be a better place if we could all respect each other's opinions while standing firm on our own. In the end, of course, I'd love to see everyone discover the God that I know, but that's ultimately between the individual and the Creator. Don't believe in a Creator? Well, we'll all find out in the end. If I'm wrong and there is no God, which I do not believe that, then I'm just worm food like everyone else. If I'm right, though, yay! You know, eternity is a long time to spend in torment. And I say that with God's love, Jen. Next up, Kevin McKaig says, I think of Christianity like a lifeboat. Some people are in the boat, surrounded by people in the water. A lot of the people in the water don't know they're in danger of drowning. Maybe they like the water. Some of us are trying to coax them into the lifeboat. Unfortunately, some people already in the lifeboat really like throwing rocks at the people still in the water. Rather than focusing on saving people, those people seem really happy to think that those people in the water are going to drown and go to hell. Instead of having love for those who need it, they have anger and seem to be really glad that people they don't like are doomed. People like that make it harder to get people out of the water, so to speak. Oh, Kevin, that's a great analogy. Nice mental picture. And Tom Brecklin, I think that's right. Sorry if I'm butchering your name, Tom. It's B-R-E-C-H-L-I-N. I'm going to say it's Brecklin. He says, hey, this was great. I don't see it on the Good Men Project anytime soon, but if it gets through, look for the firestorm. And for those interested, the Good Men Project is a website that promotes uh, men and trying to make yourselves better. Um, I've given them full permission just to grab whatever posts uh, they want off my site and post it over there. So uh, it's kind of a cool site. Lots of differing opinions. And uh, the Christian one is definitely a minority one over there. But it's good to speak up. So anyway, the link to that uh, website is in the show notes. He goes on to say, Mainstream Christians and people of faith are not the ones that yell and scream, just as you pointed out at the beginning. Yet they're the ones that get the press. Let's face it, if the media showed who we really are, it wouldn't sell papers. Great job. Well, actually, Tom, I believe this post is one of the ones they have planned for the Good Men Project site. As a matter of fact, I bet this post is one of the reasons I chose to publish some of my blog posts in the first place. It appears that the more controversial an article it is, the more hits it gets. So this one ought to be a doozy for them. The thing about this article is that it shouldn't offend anyone who's an American. I don't get offended when someone tells me the Bible is a book full of Disney stories, which they have, because it's just someone's opinion about their beliefs and they're entitled to it. That's all this article does. It doesn't condemn anyone or their beliefs, except maybe Christians who don't act like it. It simply states my Christian beliefs on certain controversial subjects, subjects that I believe can be backed up by the Bible. Yet I bet you're right. There will be a firestorm on this one if it ever posts over there. And just like some of my other posts, the comments will start wandering away from the fact that I'm asking Christians to start acting more Christ-like and instead focus more on belittling my beliefs and falsely accusing me of hating people that I don't actually hate. <sighs> anyway, thanks for dropping by and having a read, Tom. I appreciate your support here and on the other side. And lastly, who do we have here? Hmm, that name looks familiar. Sandra McCann writes, Yay! Great article. I'm sorry that you felt I was shoving it down your throat. I was doing the best I knew at the time. Your beliefs are right on. I hope and pray that Bruiser learns to speak the truth in love. I believe you did. Love you much. Mom. Ha <laughs> ha. Check it out, folks. Mom wrote in. And in typical mom fashion, it's full of guilt. <sighs> mom, mom, mom. What am I going to do with you? There's no need for an apology here. One doesn't apologize to their kid for disciplining him when the discipline is for their own good. Likewise, you shouldn't feel the need to apologize for bringing me up to know God, no matter how much I hated it at the time. Clearly, having that base helped me to come back to the Lord. So, well done. 
and thanks. Now, if you're still feeling guilty and you want to apologize for something, I'm open to groveling for making me eat liver and Brussels sprouts. Although I'm not sure there will ever be enough forgiveness in my heart for that atrocity. Thanks for writing in, Mom. Love ya. Well, folks, thanks for all the comment mojo. If you want to get your mojo on, here's how to do it. So am I right in thinking you can't really argue against e-logs, no matter how bad we want to? If you've got a loophole I can use, I'd certainly appreciate it. I don't really want to go quietly into the night, but I don't see any way to fight it. Send in your thoughts and ideas by typing arguing e-logs into the search bar at abouttruckdriving.com, picking the post out of a plethora of posts about e-logs, and leaving a comment. Or if you prefer email, we can do that too. Truckerdump at gmail.com is where you want to send it. Or you can look me up over on Twitter. I've gone with the extremely creative username of Todd McCann over there. Yes, it's true. I'm the beige of the tech world. <laughs> okay, enough promoting. So until next time, drive safe and stay out of my way.